Well, hi there. It has been a while. I am so pleased to be back with you today. I'm going to be talking about a really interesting new concept in neuropsychology called super aging. So many people who follow me here on YouTube are here for science-based practical brain health tips and knowledge so you can be your own best advocate. This information today is really, really going to help you if you want to be one of those people that is super aging from a brain health perspective. As we get older, brain health is on a spectrum. If you are lucky enough to live to the age of 65, you're going to fall into one of these categories. You are either going to be normally aging, you will have mild cognitive impairment, you will have one of the subtype of dementias, or you will be a super ager. So how would we define super aging? This is someone who is in their 80s or older, but has the short-term memory abilities of someone in their 50s or 60s. And if you looked at their brain matter under a neuro image, like an MRI of the brain, you would actually see that their brain doesn't shrink as much as a normally aging person. So they are able to somehow hold on to more brain cells and they're able able to learn and remember much more easy. We also know from autopsy studies that super agers may have the pathology of Alzheimer's, the amyloid plaques, the tau tangles in their brain, but they don't express the clinical syndrome of Alzheimer's. So that's an interesting learning point because we really don't have a one-to-one -one relationship between structure of the brain and function of the brain. And what that teaches us is some people are able to compensate for pathology at the level of the brain, but they never show it. They never show the clinical syndrome. So what is it that is special about super agers? Well, the first thing I think we should do is define normal aging. So normal cognitive aging, you are going to see a little bit of a decline in your seeing and your hearing, your processing speed, your ability to multitask. And what most people notice is rapid retrieval of information, specifically proper nouns, so people's names. It's very normal to know exactly who the person is when you look at their face. But when you try to call up their name, oh, it's just not immediately there. The fluency with which we find our words and our thoughts does shrink. It does go down a little bit as we get older. But these changes are always mild and they never interfere with our ability to be independent in everyday life. Instrumental activities of daily living are one way that we judge someone's brain health. So if you exclude any physical limitations like the effect of arthritis or any sensory limitations like glaucoma or macular degeneration or untreated hearing loss, cognitively, can someone continue to manage their finances, remember doctor's appointments and to take their medications, and to remember how to drive and to get different places that they are pretty darn familiar with. Once we tip over into functioning being impaired, because of some type of cognitive issue, now we are in the diagnostic land of dementia. And we have many, many, many subtypes of dementia, and we actually have things that mimic dementia. So it's very important as we get older to have cognitive baselines done. Every year in your Medicare annual wellness visit, you should have a cognitive screen where they talk about how your cognitive function is, your mood and behavior, and give you some type of quick test to appreciate your ability to learn, remember, reason, uh, uh, ability to do mental arithmetic orientation, just some very simple cognitive things. So what category you wind up in is really dependent on two pretty straightforward things. Over here, we have how well you control your known risk factors for dementia. We're pretty clear on exactly why people get the dementias. It is a combination for most people of some type of genetic predisposition and about 10 to 20 things that we know through a lot of hard work of very good scientists, what are the things that open up those genes and really activate them? So this is where your vascular risk factors come in, things like untreated hearing loss, untreated depression, not enough physical activity, um, smoking, drinking too much, um, air pollution has just most recently been added. Those are our known risk factors. But we also have another one over here, which is how much cognitive reserve have we built up in our lifespan? And it turns out this is where super agers really have thrived. So they have done things throughout their life that kind of adds deposits into their brain bank. And if you look, 
at where someone falls between the spectrum of risk factors and cognitive reserve, that's really where we find that people with super aging wind up in. They have uh, really uh, perfected the, the way of reducing risk factors and figuring out what actually works. So cognitive reserve, you can kind of think about it like it's, it's something that buffers the effect of brain damage. So about 25% of people who have Alzheimer's in the brain don't show that clinical syndrome of short-term memory loss. And what we think is it's enriched environments throughout the person's life. And we now know that there are seven environmental conditions that cause us to be in the super aging category. Now, again, we don't wanna overly simplify a neurobiological process that's actually quite complex, and genetics are, are definitely a big part of this. So sometimes people will listen to me talk about super aging and say, hey, my husband did all that and he still got Alzheimer's. And what I would say is the genetic load for that person was probably too much to be compensated for by what they did for their reserves. But for all of us, if we all assume we have a little bit of a predisposition, we always wanna be trying to reduce our risk factors and increase our protective factors. So the first thing that super agers do is they learn something new every day. These are people that prioritize learning. They are very naturally drawn to learning things that increase in complexity. They don't, not only have jobs that are pretty interesting and enriching, but what they choose to do in their free time generally involves things that require skills being built upon skills. So we know that education is one of the best environments for learning. And what we know is that under about 10 years of formal education is a risk factor for the dementias and over 16 years is protective. So if you have gotten to the point where you've had the opportunities in life to go to the post-secondary education level of a bachelor's degree, that research suggests to us that you're going to have a less likely chance of not only getting dementia, but being able to stay in that super aging category. So what I want you to do about that is think about how is it that I can take my current level of knowledge and skills and expertise and build on it. I want you to think about taking it to the next level. You don't wanna go so far to where you are not positively reinforced and you're not able to feel like, wow, I really did something. If you make it too hard, you're not really gonna to wanna to go back to it and do it again. So try to find what we call that sweet spot of learning and just take whatever you know, piano playing, music appreciation, cooking, whatever it is, and just try to bring it to that very next level. Number two is eating a whole foods diet. We have talked a lot here on I Care For Your Brain about the MIND diet. This is the only evidence-based diet, a food plan really, that reduces brain aging. So you can cut your risk of Alzheimer's disease by 53% by strictly following the MIND diet, and about 35% if you kind of, yeah, you know, moderately follow it. We also know that modest alcohol intake cuts the risk of dementia, Alzheimer's specifically, by about 20%. Now that is a little controversial, but most people uh, believe the long-standing conclusion in the literature that a little alcohol is actually better for your brain than no alcohol and certainly better than a lot of alcohol. So keep that one in mind. Number three thing that is more likely to get you into the super aging category is committing to moving your body more. Super agers do between 60 and 90 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity every day. Now they don't necessarily belong to the gym, but what they do do is garden, walk up and down the stairs, park farther away from the store, get up and sweep. We know that the swiftness with which we move physically as we get older is highly correlated to mental processing speed. So the more you can do physically, chances are the more you're going to be able to do mentally. Number four is get high quality sleep. Super agers get uninterrupted high quality sleep most nights, not every night, but most nights. Sleep is brain restoration. We didn't know for a long time why we actually slept, and now we know it is to clean out our brains of the waste products that build up from a day of thinking and doing. Plus, it helps us to make our new memories, and it is a form of emotional processing. It's how we figure out what we need to learn from stressful environments, how to deduce the real learning points. 
standpoint, and mostly we're focused on survival. So typically anything that was perceived as a threat throughout the day is something that we're gonna be replaying when we are in deep sleep. Most important to this conversation for super agers is that when we're in deep sleep, we are clearing away some of the amyloid that builds up naturally as we age. We know that amyloid, that sticky misshapen protein, that's what builds up in Alzheimer's disease and winds up suffocating people's brain cells and ultimately kills them. If you have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep three or more nights in any given three month period, this increases your risk for poor memory if you are over the age of 60. So I want you to use that rubric as, okay, do I need to do something about this? Should I be reporting this to my primary care doctor? I would love for you to try to cut off handheld devices at least two hours before bed. Uh, certainly never in the middle of the night. If you wake up, do not turn to that phone and play solitaire. That would be the worst thing you can do. Naps are okay, but none after 3 p.m. And we like you to keep them to about 30 minutes max, or it's going to come out of your nighttime consolidated sleep. Number four, five is that super agers value social connection. They care about maintaining social relationships that feel good and supportive. Now it's not about quantity with super agers. It is about quality. Even having one close personal relationship where you feel like you can really trust that person with your innermost concerns and fears and that they would be there for you if you really needed them. That's actually all it takes. Our desire for social connection is quite personal. We are social creatures. We do require interpersonal exchange for a fully healthy brain, but we get to define what that is. Some people are just shy and introverted by nature and other people love to be around groups of people and parties. It really is all about your personality and your time of life. People who feel lonely typically have more memory problems as they get older. And it's really the COVID pandemic that has helped us understand probably uh, quite a hurtful thing during the pandemic wasn't the virus. It wasn't uh, not being able to um, gather in large groups as much as it was being able to maintain some of our close personal relationships. Number six thing that super agers do is that they are resilient in the face of stress. They are really good at figuring out what is the best kind of silver lining that is happening in a situation and figuring out how can they move on. People over the age of 45 with perceived high stress had about 37% higher risk for memory problems compared to middle-aged folks that said they have low stress. So part of this is because of the chronic cortisol, adrenaline release that comes with stress. And also stress provides us with a pretty major internal distraction, meaning we are not mindful. We are not in the present moment. We are in our heads thinking about what happened or for most of us, what is about to happen. Number seven is that super agers think about themselves in the world in terms of their long lasting legacy. They aren't self-centered to an unusual degree. They think about how can I leave the world a better place? They are bothered by world events that make us feel like were previous wars for nothing? What is going to happen to countries of people? When I do my interviews with folks every day as a neuropsychologist, many sensitive, very intelligent older adults tell me they are very concerned about what's going on in the Middle East, very concerned about the Ukrainian war, very concerned about American politics. This is usually a sign of conscientiousness, and it turns out that is actually good for brain aging. Now, we don't want it to turn into a sense of helplessness. There is kind of a sweet spot there where we do want people thinking about the big picture and the state of the world, but not to the degree that it prevents us from doing things that will personally benefit us, like going out and moving our body, eating well, being social, engaging in cognitively stimulating activities. So like all these things I'm saying, there's kind of a, a moderation point that's really, really important here. So what I hope you got out of this lecture today is that brain health is whole person health. You're really not gonna be able to 
to just eat good, but then not move your body and have a very healthy brain as you get older. You're not going to be able to be totally stressed out, um, but go to the gym four times a week and do strength training and have a healthy, happy brain. That's just not the way it works. We're really starting to move towards this model of you got to kind of do a bunch of things. You know, all the things on the five fingers that we talk about from the finger study that came out of Europe a few years ago. It's moving your body. It's low stress. It's low depression, good mood. It's cognitive stimulation. It's anti-inflammatory diet. It is staying socially connected. It's working this brain matter up here and making sure that you are pushing it. Not so, so hard that you get stressed, but we don't want passivity in older adulthood. We don't want us to just constantly be absorbing information. We want to encourage people to act and engage in their world. That is so, so, so important. We are getting ready to hit 100,000 subscribers here on YouTube. We're just about a few thousand shy. So if you haven't subscribed, the vast majority of people who watch my lectures here don't ever subscribe. So I want to encourage you, hit that subscription button because what it enables us to do is keep bringing you high quality, free, accessible brain health information. And that is my goal. We've been here for seven years. I try to come once a week. I have had more of a break recently than I would have liked because I'm really involved in a community project right now called the Engaged Brains Project that I'm excited to come and tell you about. I'm actually going to have a really, really special guest on here soon who is my absolute hero, somebody I'm really, really excited to introduce you all to. So take care, have a great day, and I'll see you soon. Bye.